Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Wall Street Petting Zoo. This is our news segment this week at the zoo, WSPZ News. Back to you with uh, market news for this week. I'm Christopher Smith. I'm Robert Coburn. And this week, Robert, we had some uh, pretty wild stuff. We had a wild ride. Started the week a little bit weak, but uh, ended pretty strong. And I think maybe going into next week uh, into a bit of a bull market here. Uh, on Monday, the market pulled back a little bit because expectation of a Fed rate cut had waned a little bit, which is something that we talked about on Friday. And I actually had predicted that the market might pull back a little bit on Monday. So felt good about that prediction. <laughs> <laughs> And then uh, Tuesday, uh, Trump added some Chinese companies to the U.S. trades blacklist, of course, which would hurt investor confidence in the upcoming trade negotiations. So the market did pull back a bit more on top of uh, Monday. Yep, people were feeling feeling bad about the China trade talks. Uh, Wednesday, we had a bit of recovery. The Fed came back. Um, the Fed had announced that it was going to increase reserve requirements and start buying up U.S. Treasury bonds. Um, reserve requirements, basically every bank is required to keep a certain amount of cash on reserve at the Fed uh, in order to cover all of its lending obligations and so forth. Um, and so the Fed decided they were going to increase the requirement for banks to keep cash on hand. And this came in response to, in mid-September, there was this spike in what's called the repo market uh, and interest rates in that market. The repo market is basically like a really short term lending market where businesses can borrow money for one or two days using US Treasury bonds as collateral. And basically what happened in mid-September is that that market ran out of money and that caused interest rates to spike overnight. Um, the Fed, one of its jobs is to keep interest rates within a target window and so interest rates got outside that target window overnight, and they had to inject a bunch of money into that repo market in order to bring the rates back under control. And the Fed has always been a lender of last resort, so that's something that they do, but they don't want to be doing that on a regular basis. This was the first time since right before the last recession that we had had a spike in repo market rates like that. Um, so the Fed was really concerned about this because a lot of people were taking it as a possible recession signal. Um, and so basically, they're increasing those reserve requirements in order to require the banks to keep more cash on hand for those short-term lending markets so that that doesn't happen again. And then the other thing the Fed is doing is buying up treasury bonds. And basically, what the Fed is doing here is printing money and using it to buy bonds. This is something that the Fed does periodically. Uh, it's often called quantitative easing or QE, um, although the Fed this time has been very adamant that this is not QE. Um, and I think basically it's, it's, I haven't seen a good explanation of why this is not QE. I think it basically is QE, but they're just doing it on a smaller scale. Um, and rather than doing it to like stimulate the economy, they're doing it to just get the dollar within their inflation target. Um, they have a 2% target for inflation and the dollar this year has been really strong. And so they're doing this, they're injecting cash into the economy. Uh, in order to weaken the dollar a little bit, bring it back to its uh, inflation target. Basically, the way this works is the Fed prints money and buys bonds, and that increases the amount of cash in the economy for a short time until the bonds mature, and then the Fed cashes in those bonds and pulls that money back out of the economy. So basically, um, this is temporarily increasing money in the economy. It's not going to cause inflation. A lot of people were worried in the last recession. They thought, oh, the Fed is printing a bunch of money that's going to cause a lot of inflation. Uh, no, I mean, they're trying to cause a little bit of inflation, but just temporarily and just to bring the dollar back to their inflation target. Um, as a side effect, this bumped up the price of uh, bonds a little bit. And it should also, if they succeed in weakening the dollar, this should help gold and oil and other commodities, uh, Bitcoin as well, cryptocurrencies that tend to move opposite the dollar. Um, now, there's kind of a scary economic metric behind these moves, Robert, which is that foreign governments have been buying less and less U.S. debt. Traditionally, foreign governments have bought a lot of U.S. Treasury bonds, and that 
uh, keeps cash coming into our economy. It helps weaken the dollar and achieve that inflation target. And one reason the dollar has been unusually strong this year is that foreign buyers of treasuries have disappeared, especially China. China has been one of the biggest buyers of uh, U.S. treasuries. And so now the Fed has to buy those treasuries in order to keep cash coming into the economy in order to hit its target inflation rate. And so the question really is, why are foreign governments buying less of our debt? And a lot of it is probably just the trade war. Like China doesn't want to be buying our debt in the middle of a trade war because they don't know if we're going to make good on those obligations. Um, but it could also be there are some other governments that have been pulling out as well. It could be a lack of confidence in our credit. And so the question really is, is this a temporary blip that's going to go away as soon as we sign a trade deal with China? Or does it suggest that we're running up against some kind of limit on how much money we can borrow before there's a reckoning? Um, if it were that latter scenario where U.S. or foreign governments are not going to buy any more U.S. debt, um, we could be in trouble because right now we have a huge deficit in the middle of an economic boom. If there were to be an economic slowdown, the deficit would spiral upward. We'd be in trouble. So this is, uh, you know, poten another potentially worrying warning sign about the huge amount of debt that the U.S. has right now, Robert. Yeah, it's interesting that, uh, that the Fed is able to ma uh, manage the, uh, the inflation rate, which is nice because most of the time, you, if you're not managing it, then uh, it can really spiral, as you said. Uh, but yeah, I think with the trade war in China, I think it's that's definitely one of the major reasons why uh, foreign entities aren't buying, uh, buying, uh, U S treasury bonds. Um, but like you said, the, that there's a limit, is there a limit to how much, you know, the U S can, uh, lend, not lend out, but, uh, borrow from foreign powers. Yeah, I think you're probably right. I think this, assuming that the U S doesn't go into a recession and we don't see a big increase in the deficit, I think that, foreign governments will resume buying U.S. debt as soon as the trade war is resolved. Um, my worry is if we were to go into a real economic slowdown, um, we've already got such a huge deficit in a boom. Uh, a slowdown would mean you know, a drop in government revenue, and that deficit would just balloon out of control. We're already at like 100% of GDP almost. <laughs> uh, it would be, you know, it would get pretty bad pretty fast. So uh, I don't know. I, I think we could get a credit rating downgrade if um, if we were to see that deficit balloon in a recession. How many times has that been threatened in the last few years? I know that, well, not a few years, but the last decade. Because I think uh, every time the gov there's a government shutdown, don't they uh, threaten it's uh, downgrading our credit yeah, probably. I, I'm pretty sure that we had some um, some threats of downgrades during the last recession. It's a real challenge because if your credit rating gets downgraded, not only um, do you potentially have fewer lenders willing to loan you money, um, but you also are paying a higher interest rate on the loans you do get. And we already have pretty, you know, we've got rising interest rate or rising interest costs on our national debt already. Um, and if the situation continues, then in 20, 30 years, those are going to be gobbling up a bigger and bigger portion of our annual tax revenue every year. Yay, interest. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, uh, Thursday, Fidelity announced uh, they're going to a zero commission, which uh, coincides with uh, Charles Schwab and uh, TD Ameritrade. Uh, and so... That's uh, good news for investors uh, because now all I think that's except for Merrill Lynch now, um, pretty much all the major players in the uh, stock trading business are going to zero commission, uh, which basically a lot of analysts are saying that this is going to cut into uh, the bottom line of all of these major trading platforms. Uh, because they say they get actually a lot of their revenue through there. But I think you did an analysis with, uh, last week, and you said that it's really not a big chunk of their uh, their revenue, actually. 
Yeah, it's not a huge chunk of their revenue. I mean, it will decrease their earnings. I I think with Fidelity, I was looking, or not Fidelity, with Ameritrade, I was looking and thinking, this is going to cut into their earnings probably like 27%, something in that neighborhood. But they could potentially monetize new users. If they get a bunch of new users from Robinhood or uh, from Webull, they could potentially monetize that by turning those customers into uh, users into customers for their banking business because they do have a fairly big banking business. They're not just a trading platform. They are a bank. They've got a lot of other services. So there are ways for them to monetize it. Um, and of course, they can do the same thing that Robinhood and Webull do, which is when you have cash sitting in your account that's not in stocks, they basically earn interest on the cash that you have sitting in that account. So um, you know they won't lose all of that money, but they'll lose some some revenue and some income. Uh, also, Robinhood uh, this week introduced cash management with a 2.05% AP uh, interest on their accounts. They just released that this week. They teased it last year, and then uh, I think I think the Fed was like, uh, we don't know. Or no, it's not, not the Fed. It was like the FDIC is like, I don't know. I think we uh, talked about this uh, Robin Hood, and they uh, they had to like backtrack out of it, and I guess they had to like sign some deals uh, with the FDIC to make sure that they're federally insured. <laughs> yeah, that's important. <laughs> and then uh, here we are a year later, and now it's uh, now they're finally releasing it to all the Robin Hood users. So uh, Robin Hood's catching up, it looks like, to or at least in some regard to uh, the major players and. It looks like, uh, as you said, like uh, Fidelity, uh, Charles Schwab, TD Ameritrade, they're trying to get new customers or pull them from uh, from Robinhood and Rebel. Uh, in the in uh, in the marketing industry, they try and get the what's called lost souls, which are former customers. So they're trying to also recover people who may have traditionally traded on Fidelity, Charles Schwab, or TD Ameritrade, and then you know went to Robin Hood or Weeble such, such as me or you uh, where or at least I used to trade on Fidelity specifically and then uh, I went to Robin Hood right right yeah this is uh, great news for investors I mean anytime that companies get into a price war <laughs> it's great for customers uh, not necessarily great for the companies but you know I think that when companies get into a price war, that's not necessarily a good thing for the industry because they're focusing on price instead of value. Um, I think that these companies would do better probably to really emphasize the value that they're bringing. Um, but uh, one other piece of brokerage news, Robert, uh, Webull has started its uh, big WeTrader competition that has a Tesla as one of the prizes. Um, that's going on right now. If you want to sign up for it, you've got to sign up before the trading week begins. So today, uh, Sunday, would be a great day to sign up for this coming week of trading. And basically, you have 100 trades, and they put $10,000 of paper money in your account, and you trade stocks and see if you can beat all the other traders out there. So it's kind of a fun thing to do if you're learning how to trade. Yeah, and if you don't have a Webull account, we'll have we have a link down in the description below that will uh uh it's our referral link so that basically when we refer you you get a free stock we get a free stock uh so if you're not signed up already make sure you sign up i myself uh i couldn't actually use a tesla because i live in an apartment so <laughs> can't really install a uh, charge station unless i had to go out to the charge station every uh i think it's like every two or three weeks you have to do it that's fair. That's fair. I think there are also some gift cards and things like that available as prizes. I don't recall what all the prizes are, but Tesla is just one of the prize tiers. So there are other things that may be uh, of value to you, Robert. But yeah, that clicking that referral link is a great way to support the podcast. So all of you out there who like our podcast uh, want us to keep doing it, please, uh, please do that. Click that link and help us out. All right, uh, Thursday and Friday, we got a big rally in the stock market as rumors circulated that the U.S. and China were close to an interim trade deal. And that deal got announced on late Friday. There was a huge spike 
in stock prices. And then it came plummeting right back down because the initial announcements of that deal were incredibly light on details. Um, you pointed out to me, Robert, that uh, it doesn't seem like they actually signed a deal. They just announced a tentative deal. Um, and also, this deal is incredibly light on details. It doesn't actually resolve the trade war. It just temporarily prevents it from escalating. So basically, there were some tariffs scheduled to go in effect on Tuesday. And so we have suspended those tariffs. And in exchange, China has agreed to buy $50 billion of agricultural products, U.S. agricultural products. And that's the, uh, the sum of this temporary deal, this interim deal. Tariffs are going to be delayed for three weeks while we work on the next phase, a more complete deal. So we're still in negotiations for the next three weeks. I do think that the market probably will move higher uh, next week um, on the strength of this interim deal, but I doubt it will be with any kind of conviction. Um, so I know uh, for the, the increase in tariffs, uh, some people are saying this is a the, the way it was implemented by Trump is actually really smart because what he did was he actually, uh, since we got rid of NAFTA and all the other trade agreements prior to this, essentially he just basically put a timeline and said, okay, if you don't agree to a new trade deal, we're going to we're have to like, it's like, it started at 15% and it went up to 20% after I think it was like 90 days. And then the next 90 days he bumped it up to, you know, 30% and he's, He's basically just saying, well, if you guys aren't going to agree to anything, we're just going to keep increasing the tariffs over and over and over again. And now China's finally like, oh, wait, you're serious? <laughs> and so now uh, I think that's why China's kind of back, come back to the table. And actually, this is one of the few things that Trump has actually uh, done something I agree with in terms <laughs> of, uh, you know, making sure that... Uh, trades are done fairly between uh, across borders. Yeah, deadlines are always helpful. And China really has been a bad actor. I mean, there have been a lot of uh, issues with China. They're stealing technology. They are manipulating currency. Like these, these issues have been around for a long time. So probably need to make some headway on them. Uh, unfortunately, you know, Trump has not managed the negotiations very well. He's been incredibly volatile and sort of unpredictably escalated things. Um, I, I suppose that could ultimately play to his advantage because China doesn't know what to expect from him. But on the other hand, the fact that he's unpredictable and they don't know what to expect from him means that he can't be trusted to keep to any agreement that they make. And we've seen that a couple times in trade negotiations so far, where he's sort of just unpredictably raised the bar and they've walked away. So, like uh, building the wall and getting Mexico to pay for it, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So... Um, it's been a tumultuous negotiation, but we're making headway a little bit at a time, I guess. Yeah. So there, are, there are a bunch of companies that actually would benefit, uh, from a finalized trade deal, uh, from, uh, a trade deal, but, uh, from Trump basically between us and China. So, uh, a few of them, uh, like Alibaba, Honeywell, Qualcomm, Apple, Walmart, Caterpillar. I know that's big on your list. Uh, General Motors and Ford, which is uh, in my in my portfolio, uh, those ones would actually benefit from a China deal because they have uh, the biggest revenue exposure, and they also have the most imports from China. So they basically import products from China to produce whatever final product they produce. So, so like in terms of like Apple, obviously the like the cases and the the chips for their phones are all built in China, so that way. You know, when you buy it here, it's not astronomically expensive, even though technically they are astronomically expensive, they wouldn't be as expensive. Yeah, the uh, the tech companies, and especially the chip companies like AMD and Micron uh, and Qualcomm, you mentioned, have a lot of exposure to China, um, and especially to Huawei, the uh, cell phone company that uh, we slapped sanctions on earlier this year. Um and also the agricultural equipment companies have been real bellwethers. Uh, Caterpillar and John Deere uh, have a lot of exposure to China because they sell to China a lot. So they could get big boosts um, from a China trade deal. Uh, oil companies have been affected. 
we've seen mining companies heavily affected. So lots of companies stand to gain, but the ones that you mentioned are definitely some of the ones with the, the biggest exposure. Oh, you I'm looking at your list here and you forgot to mention Kohl's. Oh yeah. I think I just uh went over the list. I didn't really specifically say each one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You've got a nice uh little chart here, Robert. You want to tell us about your chart? Yeah, the, so it looks like a uh, I was able to pull a chart from CNBC where it basically says like the most sensitive to tariffs or retailers that are most sensitive to tariffs. And it's uh, like floor and decor has probably like the biggest percentage that oh, close to 50% of their products are exposed to Chinese duties, which basically means that over 50% of their products are uh, taxed or ta tariffs are leveraged on their products because they come from China. Uh, Restoration Hardware is another company. Advanced Auto Parts, AutoZone, O'Reilly. So the 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 two big uh, automotive uh, stocks. So AutoZone and O'Reilly. Uh, Thirty five percent of their products are imported from China. Uh, Bed Bath and Beyond, Dick Sporting Goods, uh, National Vision, Five Below, and uh, Williams Sonoma. Are, yeah, uh, that's that's a great there. list. I'm I'm gonna have to check out some of those companies and uh, see how they do this week. Yeah, I uh, I did follow Bed Bath and Beyond's earnings a week or two ago, and um, they had a pretty solid quarter, but basically their their revenue and sales had fallen off a lot. They had uh, stayed in business, stayed profitable by basically laying off a bunch of people. Um, so they had increased the efficiency of their business. And I think that if sales and revenue were to come back up, probably some of those efficiencies they will be able to hold on to. Uh, so they could have a really, really good next quarter if we get a resolution of the trade war. That'll be interesting yeah. to see. Yeah. All right. So uh, uh, what stocks are you looking at this week? Well, let's. Uh, there's one more piece of news here. Oh. Um, on Friday... The U.S. announced that it's going to be sending new, more troops and a new missile defense system and some fighter jets into Saudi Arabia to help defend the Saudi oil fields uh, from further aggression by Iran. Uh, this comes in the aftermath of an Iranian tanker blowing up. Iran hasn't made any allegations specifically about who did that, but strongly suspected that this is Saudi Arabia retaliating for the attack on its oil fields. So we're seeing kind of an escalation of the oil war in the Middle East right now, and the U.S. is going to send uh, some more troops and so forth over there. And this could be extremely good for aerospace and defense contractor stocks, and especially for Lockheed Martin, because Lockheed is the U.S.'s contractor for Saudi missile defense systems. So this deal means more money for Lockheed. And that came uh, after the close of the after-hour session on uh, Friday, so... This has not been priced in yet, and so potentially if you get up really early on Monday morning and buy into some Lockheed stock, you could uh, get the bump from that news. Okay. I think, uh, uh, I think Lockheed is on your stock watch this week. Stock it is on my stock watch, li watch list. That makes a nice uh, transition here. I'm going to buy Lockheed early Monday morning because of those troops going to Saudi Arabia. And I also think Lockheed could get a nice bump from the trade war truce. Uh, they're an aerospace company. Aerospace has been one of the industries uh, hit by the trade war. Um, so they could get a bump. I've also got Raytheon, which is another defense contractor that uh, won a $12 million government radar contract late on Friday. And it's also up on news of a merger with United Technologies. That's been around for a few days but it's been moving upward on the strength of that news. And I think it could get a bump from the trade war truce and uh, from news of troops being sent to Saudi Arabia as well, because it's got some uh, involvement in just in general uh, with the US military. So I'll buy that one early Monday morning as well for the bump. And then I've got a Caterpillar, which makes agricultural equipment. It's been getting huge boosts from any good news related to the trade war. Uh, that really is the stock to watch on Monday to see how the market is feeling about the trade deal, whether we're feeling optimistic about the deal or whether we're feeling like, oh, this is a letdown. Um, it's a pretty cheap stock right now at 128. Uh, and I think that if the market is feeling positive about the trade war, we could get up near 133 next week. Um, 
And then Freeport McMoran is another one that's been going up on uh, China trade news. It's got lots of China exposure. It's way down for the year. Uh, it's been hit hard by the trade war this year, and it's you know pretty inexpensive right now compared to where it was a year ago. It's currently $9.55 a share, and it's been heading up toward a long-term trend line around, it, it'll probably meet that around $10 this week. So I think that we could get you know a 50 cents per share uh, boost in that one, which would be about a 5% gain in Freeport McMoran this week. And then the other thing that I'm watching is gold. Uh, I think if the dollar, the dollar has been coming down uh, over the course of the last week because of the news of uh, the Fed doing the quantitative easing and um, also uh, managing the purchasing more U.S. treasuries. So I think the dollar uh, is going to enter a new downtrend. Probably it's been an uptrend, but it's at a it's at the trend line and. So on Monday, we're going to find out whether it's going to hold its trend line or whether it's going to break out downward. I think it'll break out downward. And if it does, gold is going to explode and it could be a really good week for gold. So that's another one that I am going to buy Monday morning. All right. And the, the stocks that I'm watching this week, uh, Activision Blizzard. So Activision Blizzard uh, about a year ago, is, is post, it was over 70 points. Uh, and then it suddenly dropped down to about 40 uh, last year. And so it's slowly been climbing its way back up uh, over the last year. But recently they've been caught up in some controversy with uh, the handling of an eSports champion. Uh, Activision Blizzard announced last week that they were, after the champion had uh, voiced their support for Hong Kong, that the... that. Activision Blizzard was going to take away their winnings and also suspend them for one year, uh, which created a huge amount of backlash uh, in the online esports community. Uh, and so uh, late Friday, Activision Blizzard announced that they're giving back the winnings uh, to the, the champion and also only reducing their suspension from one year to six months. Uh, which still uh, over the weekend there still seems to be a lot of backlash on that. Uh, so we'll see how the the stock uh, works out this week and see if it, it feels an impact uh, because they do run on subscription services in Activision Blizzard. They also do have uh, Call of Duty Mobile that's coming out re within the, the next month, I believe it's going to be coming out, and also uh, the Call of Duty game uh for that's launching on pc consoles uh that's also coming out within uh this month so it'll be interesting to see how the stock performs uh with the with the controversies that's going on uh but also with all the some of their major titles that are coming out th uh, this month also at the end of the month is blizzcon which uh blizzard uses to announce all their uh upcoming projects for the entire year usually if it's a good uh, convention, then you usually see the stock rally. If it's uh, a ho hum uh, ho hum uh, convention like last year when they announced the disastrous Diablo Mobile, uh, then we'll we won't see the stock uh, go up. We'll actually see it go down. Uh, another stock I'm actually looking at is WWE. Uh, at one point, this stock was over a hundred, like it just breached over a hundred points last year, uh, but it was only for I think. For only a couple of days, it was over 100. And then over the last six months, it's just been slowly dropping down to 70. Uh, they recently uh, promoted one of their subscription shows, NXT, to the USA Network. So it's no longer on a paid subscription uh, model, but now it's on network TV. Uh, and they've also transitioned uh, SmackDown, one of their premiere shows, to Fox. So now they have... Two major shows on USA Network, one major show on Fox, and Fox seems to be all in when they're portraying WWE as a premier brand. Like everything they do for like major sports, like NFL, like their graphics, uh, how they've been treating the draft, it seems like they're just all in. Like they've pretty much dedicated a lot of resources to this. Even like some of the announcers that you could tell aren't really big fans of WWE. They're at least trying to, you know, hype up the product and basically make it, uh, bring in new audiences. They've even uh, signed Cain Velasquez uh, from the UFC. Uh, 
who actually fought Brock Lesnar and took away his UFC title in real life uh, about like nine years ago. And so they're hyping up another fight between uh, Brock Lesnar and Cain Velasquez. So they're pouring in a lot of money on this. And also not only to mention AEW, uh, which is uh, which is headed by the Khan family. Uh, they also own uh, the Jacksonville Jaguars. Uh, the they finally have the WWE finally has some real competition, which I believe will help uh, drive not only WWE in general to new heights, but that whole industry is probably going to grow. Uh, so I'm hoping to see that stock uh, slowly start to climb back up now that it's, I th- I feel like it's bottomed out at about seventy, uh, and so I'm looking forward to seeing if the the stock grows. Uh, they have another show at the end of the month at Crown Jewel. Uh, which is in Saudi Arabia, uh, but they never mention it's in Saudi Arabia. They just call it Crown Jewel. Uh, but yeah, so there's a lot of big things for WWE. So I believe it's one of the stocks that uh, should be looked at. And then uh, this week, uh, all the bank stocks or report their core their Q3 earnings this week. I think Tuesday Tuesday is the day where most of them. I think Wednesday is uh, also the supplemental day for the ones that don't report on Tuesday. Uh, So the full impact of the Fed rate cuts, I don't think they'll be on full display when they report their quarterly earnings, Uh, but it'll be interesting to see what the results are because uh, it should show some, or it should be a good way to see trends to see, you know, if it's going to be a big impact or is it going to be just like a minor impact? Yeah, banks have been down quite a bit, and I think that, like, the technicals look good for a bounce if the earnings are good, so... If the earnings go well, I think the banks could really see a big rally. So, yeah, I'm I'm paying attention to that as well. You know, it's interesting, Robert, you talked about uh, AEW coming in as competition for WWE. Um, I, I feel like a lot of investors would see that as a bad thing for the uh, for WWE because, you know, new entrants, new competition always means maybe some of your customers are going to go somewhere else. But I think you're right that this could be good for them. Um there's this dynamic called duopolies uh, when you have sort of two major companies that dominate an industry, they often tend to uh, benefit each other. And Freakonomics Radio had a great episode on duopolies. You know, Coke and Pepsi, for instance, have been really good for each other. The Democrats and Republicans have been really good for each other. Uh, just the it creates a kind of brand loyalty that people wouldn't have if there was no competition. So I think you're right. I think that could be really good for the WWE. Yeah. I'm, uh, as a wrestling fan myself, like I'm super excited to see, you know, how it goes and what kind of competition is stemmed from it. Because I mean, for so long, WWE has been like the de facto standard and there hasn't been really a competition to help drive them to do better. So they like the products kind of gotten stagnant. So, uh, with AEW being headed by the Khan family, or at least being financed by the Khan family, and then being ran by uh, Dusty Rhodes' son, Cody Rhodes, uh, it seems like they're like they've really put their foot on the gas, and also kind of like tapped WWE on the shoulder and said, "Hey, you know, we're for real." Yeah, yeah, that's great. Well, that uh, brings us to a close for our news episode this week. Uh, Everybody, please do support the podcast by sharing the video, commenting, liking the video. Uh, Check out underneath the video for that referral link for Webull. Uh, Go sign up for Webull using our referral link that supports the podcast and uh, gives us a little bit of money to sink into uh, recording equipment and so forth um, and helps maybe pay us a little bit for our time down the road. We're not there yet, but uh, I think Robert and I are both hoping that someday we won't be doing this completely for free. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, really appreciate all of your support. Uh, you can also tweet us at, uh, at WSPZoo. We're on Twitter. And uh, throughout the week, if I see an interesting chart, um, I've been posting those cool charts from Seeking Alpha and Market Watch and other places that uh, post interesting articles. So Follow us on Twitter to uh, catch some of those midweek updates. Uh, I also am on Trading Zoo as Christopher Carroll Smith. And uh, we're on Facebook uh, under Wall Street Petting Zoo. You can just search for us on Facebook and follow us on Facebook. There also will be a link to that down underneath the video. Did I miss anything, Robert? I think you said Trading Zoo and not Trading View. 
did I? <laughs> <laughs> Wall Street Petting Zoo is our podcast, and Trading View is the platform where I hang out and do stock analysis midweek. All right, well, thank you guys so much for listening, and we will see you at the zoo next week.